Well, good morning and welcome to all of you colonialist enthusiasts. On behalf of the Board of Trustees of the American Numismatic Society and our director, Dr. Uta Wartenberg Kagan, I'd like to welcome all of you to the Stack Family Coinage of the Americas Conference for 2006. This COAC, as these events have uh, become fondly known, uh, is an occasion for the study of many areas of numismatics relating to the Americas. And it's my pleasure today to welcome you to a session that has been organized by our trustee, Roger Saboni, and our staff person adjunct from Canada, Oliver Hoover, on Mark Newby's St. Patrick coinage, one of the earliest issues utilized in our neighboring province of New Jersey. Uh, I'll be introducing the speakers this morning and this, uh, this afternoon and uh, giving a little bit of welcome and introduction to them. Each of the speakers will uh, be given an opportunity to answer questions following his presentation. We are trying to time the talks today so as to not to run too late before we go to our little adventure at the famous Francis Tavern for the dinner party following the conference this evening. Uh, I ask each of the speakers to repeat a question for the microphone and for our webcasting purposes uh, whenever there is a question being offered from the audience. And we'll try to have a brief break between each of the talks as well to try to catch up with the audio portion of our webcasting so that uh, the sound will keep up with the images. Now, uh, before we proceed further, I'd like to invite our colleague Vikan Yegparian, representing the Stack family, to uh, give us a few remarks about this occasion. We certainly appreciate the warm support of the Stack family for the American Numismatic Society over the years and their sponsorship of these important events in the study of numismatic Americana. Vikan? Thank you, Bob, and, and good morning, all. Thanks for coming out so early on uh, this uh, Veterans Day weekend. Um, on behalf of Harvey, Larry, and Susan Stack, and the entire staff of Stacks, I wish to welcome you all to the 2006 Stack Family Coinage of the Americas Conference. This year is special to all of us at Stacks, as our recent merger with American Numismatic Rarities has greatly expanded our family to include numismatic luminary Q. David Bowers, our new president, Christine Karstedt, and the entire ANR staff. Stax, as you know, has long been a friend of the ANS, from before the days of the Joseph and Morton Stack Memorial Lectures to our recent moral and financial support of the move from Audubon Terrace to here at Fulton Street. Stax supports the ANS collections with donations of material, and we have extended our numismatic expertise and services on num numerous occasions. Stax is also fortunate that we can help make these ANS coax happen year in, year out. Over their more than two decades long history, the coax have grown into a much anticipated event during which researchers can explore a subject in depth, report on new discoveries, or reevaluate old interpretations of the fields of American coins, medals, tokens, and paper money. Having read some of the past works of our pre presenters on today's difficult topic, I know that we are in for a day of pleasurable learning, discussion, and perhaps even some friendly argument. So enjoy today's numismatic festivities, and I hope to see you all again at the 2007 Stack Family Coinage of the Americas Conference. Thank you, and enjoy the day. Thank you very much, Vikan, and welcome. Uh, if anyone has a cell phone that has not been turned off yet, please do so uh, to avoid interfering with our broadcasting, our webcasting, and our sound system here during the course of today's events. It's my great pleasure to welcome and introduce our first speaker this morning. Uh, this is Robert Heslip from the Culture and Heritage Office of the Belfast City Council. Uh, Mr. Heslip has, is a numismatist who's worked in a number of areas with Irish coinage from the Hiberno Norse, the earliest coinages of Ireland, up to the uh, famous gun money and Ulster tokens of the 18th century and uh, he's worked with uh, Irish coinage and its circulation both on, on the island and abroad. His topic today is an overview of circulating coinage and tokens in 17th century Ireland, the 
background, really, of what we know as the St. Patrick coinage. Robert, welcome. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. Uh, I must say that it's an enormous uh, honour and pleasure um, to be invited to speak to the COAC conference. It's something which I've um, observed and admired from afar uh, almost since its beginning and always wished that I could be uh, here. Um, I hope that what I'm going to say is of some interest and value. Um, it may or may not be because uh, I'm looking at the context, and my view of the context may be rather different from your view of the context. However, my brief is to give some overview of how the St. Patrick's coinage appeared, at whatever date that might be. I'm not going to get into uh, that area at all. But for the purposes of today, I'm going to stop at uh, 1680, which seems an appropriate and indeed safe terminus. And simply on the odd occasion where, on which I need to mention the maiden subject of the conference, and in ignorance of what Dr. Mossman is going to say, I will refer to the larger of the denominations, halfpennies, and the smaller as farthings, I hope without any prejudice. Perhaps I should also start by giving you some reasons why perhaps I am not the most appropriate person to do this important scene setting exercise, followed by a much shorter list of possible qualifications. A lot of my work in Irish coinage has focused on, very, on regional variation. The idea that Dublin was very much sui, sui generis and tells us perhaps not a lot about what was going on in the rest of the country. My research has also tended to centre on periods which bracket any of the presumed dates of the St. Patrick's and also shied away from their undoubted complexities, a decision which the more I learn, the more I'm glad I made. On the plus side, as a very young student very many years ago, alternating work on what was still the largest series of post-medieval excavations in Ireland and on the coin hoards held by the Ulster Museum, it became clear to me that, that no one had addressed the dates when the heterogeneous copper coinages of the 17th century circulated, a situation not helped by the poor quality of what may, pre may be presented as the standard reference, Nelson's The Coinage of Ireland in Copper, Tin, tin and Copper of 1905. This brought me up against the problem which I'm sure all the speakers here today will have faced, that people very, very rarely discuss circulating coinage in written sources, and when they do, it is generally in an anomic, if not actually misleading manner. Even today, at least in Europe, a lot of numismatic research tends to focus on hoard evidence rather than single finds, a situation exacerbated by an administrative and legislative system predisposed towards recording the latter, as well as an archeological establishment biased towards medieval and earlier periods. Uh, I should say that another qualification is that I, I uh, have probably looked at more excavation coins than anybody else in, in Ireland and have uh, particularly concentrated on uh, historic or post-medieval archaeology. As a general rule, base metal was not hoarded, and when it, when it was, there was often reasons to believe that the resultant sample is more than usually misleading. In the past, collectors and scholars have also tended to concentrate on the more attractive pieces in gold and silver. When one adds in the paucity of written and material evidence for the, situa for the situation, the leading economic historian of the period uses the term dark ages as appropriate for the first two thirds or three quarters of the 17th century. Perhaps my uh, cup of, e over of excuses overflows. Enough, perhaps, negativity. Let us start then on what may well be the most boring roller coaster ride in New York. I'm going to devote most of my time to a simple chronology of the copper issues, but at the same time will be, I hope, offering evidence which may or may not support particular theses. In some ways, the 17th century is the key to understanding Ireland. Many of the current political problems are traced back to the period, but it also marks the transition between a medieval, or even more, more archaic in the eyes of much of Europe, world, to one which is recognisably modern. Unfortunately, history rarely conform, 
precisely to 100-year slots. But the defeat of the Irish and Spanish forces at Kinsale in 1601 in a very real way marks the end of the power of the Gaelic lords, a defeat ratified and further defined by first the Treaty of Mellifont, then more definitively by the flight of the Earls in 1607. These matters have considerable economic impact. The Nine Years' War, which culminated in these events, uh, effectively ruined Ireland. The conflict was marked by scorched earth devastation by both sides, further and deliberately worsened by Queen Elizabeth's coinage policies. She had been convinced that the removing the rebels, in her eyes, access to good silver, and hence internationally viable negotiable currency, was crucial and just as importantly would lead a huge, yield a huge profit. The result was her third coinage for Ireland of shillings, sixpences and threepences in an alloy of only 25% silver, plus a huge innovation, copper pennies and halfpennies dated 1601-02. These unattractive coins have received little attention, even though they were produced on a massive scale, probably about £300,000 worth of the billing, much greater than any possible economic need for a declining overwhelmingly rural population estimated that's at about 1.4 million and in the midst of a severe, severe depression. The aims of the exercise were political and revenue raising. The base coin was designed to suck sterling out of Ireland at a profit, replicating Henry VIII's policy 75 years earlier. Given the lack of urban infrastructure and anything approaching substantive retail activity, the need for the copper pennies and halfpennies can also be depreciated. It is more likely to be explained by the close family ties of Sir Richard Martin and his son of the same name, master workers at the Royal Mint, with whom the indenture was made. Uh, they are links with the new copper mining, English copper mining and distribution companies. In spite of these, their multifarious activities, the Martins were in financial trouble and on the make. Leaving aside the profit from supplying the copper, they were paid a total of, total of four shillings and fourpence, 22 pence plus 30 pence a pound for a coining. These Elizabethan coppers deserve honourable mention at COAC as the first coinage connection between Ireland and America. In 1990, a 1601 penny turned up on excavations at Jordan's Journey in Virginia, heavily coated in tin, a practice which would have allowed it to circulate as a threepence in Ireland, the only difference between the two denominations being the metal and absence of date on a higher value. So I, I trust that it will make its way into Dr Mossman's um, uh, corpus. Subsequently, a larger group of pennies and halfpennies were found during the Association for the, for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities dig at Jamestown, along with quantities of copper scrap metallurgically identical to the coins. Significantly, the Martin family also had connections with the, with the Virginia plantation. The Jordan's Journey coin would appear to indicate that these Irish pieces were taken from circulation rather than a simply stock left over at the mint. Their success is hard to gauge. The excavated recovery of, apparent, of over 100 apparently discarded specimens in Carrickfergus, some showing absolutely no signs of wear, and in an area associated with mil military barracks, would tend to indicate a certain lack of popularity at a time when there was no other substitute. James I issued a proclamation in October 1603, reducing the billing coins to their intrinsic value, making a threepence worth a penny. The co copper was to mean remain current, chiefly for the relief and sustenance of the lives of the poor who are not other, able otherwise to help themselves than by the charitable devotion of others. We therefore do charge and command all such as sell victual or other commodities fit for their relief to receive of the said poor the said pence and halfpence, so it not exceed not four pence at a time. So there, there's a, a, a very clear definition of their purpose. Leaving aside the precise role of the king in drafting proclamations and the possible transference of the Scottish experience, I read this legislation as explicitly denying any substantive economic rather than charitable role for the copper coins at this time. The next base coinage traditionally associated with Ireland are, are, is the patent farthings issued under licence by Lord Harrington. A main part of their design is a harp and, the, and legislation enables their circulation in Ireland. To my knowledge, none of the series before the Miltravers ovals have been found here. 
there, rather, sorry. <laughs> a proclamation of 1623 survives, explicitly relating to the farthings, and another by Lord Deputy Wentworth, addressing a, alleged complaints that they were not being accepted in 1634. This mirrors similar English versions, with the exception that a specific method of exchange of silver was set up in Dublin. This could easily have been the trigger to bring these coins into actual circulation, rather than an indication that they were already functioning. But they are rare finds compared with England, and I know of no examples of the succeeding and very common rose far farthings from Ireland. I should say that a lot of my evidence is negative evidence, which is notoriously unreliable. My reading of this confused situation is that while in England there were problems with the farthings and they were unpopular, there was also some need which at least made them worth forging, and that, that fines clearly indicate cir extensive circulation, but in, in Ireland the situation was much more marginal. To quote my teacher Michael Dolly, the wars of the 1640s gave a new lease of life to the old monetary chaos. As well as chaos, the Eleven Years' War brought about a spectacular monetization of the Irish economy. Not just the coinage was chaotic, the politics of the period are mind-bogglingly complicated and I have no intention of attempting to explain them. So don't worry if you have no intimate knowledge of the Confederation of Kilkenny. The relevant thing is that it both issued its own coins and provided comprehensive tariffs for what may be assumed to be the, almost the totality of the circulating medium. It ordered that £400 of copper was to be used to make farthings and halfpennies, with designs modelled on the English farthings, but in flan several times the larger, the total coinage perhaps having a face value of less than £65. The amount is negligible, and it may have been intended mainly for the highly developed economy in the immediate Kilkenny area. Forgeries or anomalous types are common. Just as important for our understanding of the petty coinage, some of the ba old base sil silver was also re-tariffed, perhaps confirming its continued circulation below a strata of good silver. For example, the white goat groat of copper, which I presume is the Elizabethan uh, third coinage, was doubled in value to tuppence. It's at this point that James Simon introduces the red herring of the St. Patrick's coins into the 1640s. Oh my goodness, I am making a, making a, a judgment about the date of the coinage. Uh, the ridiculous nature of the association should only be confirmed by the fact that the following passage lists several Dublin tokens demonstrably of the next decade. Simon was not good on tokens. He totally fails to mention the Ulster example circulating at exactly the same time as he must have been writing. The same thing applies to the base cork halfpenny, which in some examples can be seen to be struck over a token date of 1677, but he dates again in the 1640s. And it needs to be recognised that, that a lot of what he wrote is polemic relating to the political and coinage controversies of his own time. So beware. There are, however, low value pieces struck in a number of southern cities of refuge. These were cities basically under, under siege. They are all rare and relate to very specific circumstances and unlikely to tell us much about the wider economic conditions. Notably, none are paralleled in Dublin, where the economy was much stimulated as constrained by the difficult conditions. Uh, it should also be noted that some of the, the silver emergency coinages went down to as low as tuppence, but all these lower denominations from uh, a shilling down are extremely rare and, uh, re and uh, almost never appear in, any, uh, in fines or hoards. What I have said may or may not have been of interest to this audience. A consideration of the 17th century traders' tokens is bound to be more germane to the, token under consideration, uh, the topic under consideration. First, however, it's per perhaps worth looking at the wider currency, what contemporaries would have recognised as real money. In Ireland, this meant silver. Gold was scarce until the 18th century, and fines can be counted in the fingers of one hand. The defining element of the silver coinage was hammered Elizabeth I, uh, sixpences and shillings. These mostly came over during the Eleven Years' War, not at the time of their, their striking, and usually compose of at least 50% uh, of the hoards from that period, the other half being made up of Charles I half-crown shillings and sixpences. The Irish economy did not seem to be capable, capable of keeping good insular coinage in circulation, with complaints about shortage of both specie and capital constant. The sixpence was the smallest denomination in, in, in common use. Though smaller ones were, were produced, 
It was only in low numbers, and it appears that demand was also low as well. Foreign, mainly Spanish coins, circulated, initially mainly in the southwest, but proclamations relating to it for the country as a whole start in 1652. Again, the small, smallest common denomination was the two reals. The vast majority was in the form of fours and eights, or their equivalents. As the availability and quality of the English coins declined quite quickly, and again there is little sign that Commonwealth coins came over, this will have had the effect of increasing the gap between anything that could be remotely regarded as a small change and the bulk of the circulating medium. The token series starts in 1653, slightly later than in England. This date, however, should be seen in the context of the, that the Cromwellian context of conquest of Ireland was not regarded as being completed before April 1652, and the last formal battle of the war was not won until a year later. It is tempting to see a coincidence with the date of formal union of England and Ireland under the Commonwealth, though there are only two pieces actually dated 1653. Many existing works habitually refer to the tokens as addressing a shortage of small change. There are clear, clear historiographic reasons for this. At the end of the 18th century, collectors catalogued the contemporary tokens as they appeared. Even then, in many cases, not perhaps filling an actual need, though with the industrialization, this argument is weaker. Uh, the need was, was as much a shortage of good as opposed to forged copper. The 17th century coins were studied much later, and it was easy to project explanations back. We still see this, tend to see the 17th and early 18th centuries through this distorting lens. When it, one can also argue whether a penny was actually small change in the middle of the 17th century. Secondly, Ireland under, underwent a demographic disaster in the early 1650s, perhaps losing a quarter of the population. And I will show that dated issues concentrate on that decade, that the vast majority of issuers, when we can identify them, do not fall into the category of shopkeepers even in Dublin. And finally, for now, the tokens were issued by town corporations, which otherwise provided minimal public service. At the same time, a huge change was taking place in land tenure, with the la Irish land being used to redeem back pay of the new model army. Whilst recent work has tended to downgrade the scale of change in terms of land occupation, the, ten the tenants, in other words, numbers of adventurers were attracted in. Token issues in Ireland in general have received lamentably little attention. Perhaps the written sources are too scarce and too difficult, but even a cursory look at the Dublin list and work by Colm Gallagher in the south and, my, and by itself in the north shows that issuers generally fall into the category of entrepreneur, a picture which is reinforced when che one checks distribution against population. Somewhere like Lisburn could muster 14 tokens, Belfast 26. Population statistics is another area where information is difficult, but best estimates for circa 1660, taking this as a convenient middle date, suggest that under, there were under 2,000 people in Belfast and a few hundreds, perhaps 700, in Lisburn. To take a single example, there are only seven private token issuers in Dublin, in, in Cork, a prosperous, well-established city with possibly 10,000 inhabitants. Even Dublin, with at least 40% of foreign trade in 1660 and about 25,000 people, probably disproportionately engaged in service industries, has about 144 issues, where comparison with Belfast would suggest over 300. This is an argument I, I'm prepared to extend at another time, but I think that a simple equation between the tokens in general, the St. Patrick's coins specifically, and the need and utility is potentially misleading. It seems clear that putting out tokens was a profitable business for these with even a small amount of capital. Jumping forward, Armstrong and Legg were able to send, sell on their permission to mint the heavy regal halfpennies for £1,500 in June 1680, a coinage for which the costs of production were vastly greater than the private tokens. To my, perhaps partial eye, this situation seems fairly explicit in the 1661 proclamations attempting to suppress the tokens. Several persons took a liberty without restraint to make a kind of brass or copper tokens with such tramps, stamps as they pleased in very great proportions and vented them to the people for a penny each piece in exchange under pretense that when they should be called in or decried, the persons who uttered them would receive them back again at the rates at which, for which they issued them, whence followed. 
that for the v value of every 20 pence which, which the brass stood in, there was raised near 20 shillings in pure silver coin. And that ton and those brass tokens issued among the people, it came to pass that many of those that caused such tokens to be stamped, so stamped and issued, and that they and others having by, by exchange of those tokens possessed themselves of cons considerable sums of pure silver. In other words, you could make, if you issued a pound of tokens, you were making, making nearly a pound of profit. The other part of this equation may be less clear, but as I have already indicated, is that in my view, the need for copper coin has, in general has been heavily overestimated. There, and for Ireland, there's been a, a, a definite confusion between the lack of money in temporary terms, gold and silver only, capital and copper. Sir William Petty's, it's himself a token issuer, economic writings, have been substantially ignored by students of coinage. Many of his figures can be disputed, especially in absolute rather than relative terms, but he's an unrivaled source for both statistics and a contemporary view of how the economy was understood to work. This neglect contra contrasts with the continued influence and partial understanding of the contemporary, politically driven arguments over the Woods coinage, to open another can of worms, and in part by the modern lack of understanding of the way in which money worked in the past, as exemplified by the continued use of barter as an explanation of how the economy operated in the absence of small coins. To return to the matter in hand, whether one is looking for an early or a late date of, for the St. Patrick's, their introduction must have, to some degree, coincided with the much smaller traders' tokens. I have long thought that the latter series was amenable to basic statistical analysis, particularly looking at common ornaments, motifs, and modules. But for today, tabulating the dates of issue would appear to offer some insights, hmm. especially if we do this for Dublin and elsewhere separately. The main obstacle and, and difficulty to this is the si size of the proportion with no dates, nearly 52% overall, 56% for Dublin. I suspect that there's another distorting factor for the city. Dated tokens tend to cluster by locality, which again cluster by trade. This would match the, the idea that agents for the main London manufacturers will have been targeting areas for business. Given, a time, a lot, given time, a lot of the undated pieces could be placed in their approximate chronological order stylistically, but for the present I am, dangerously perhaps, assuming that they would not alter the picture. For outside Dublin, I've worked on a sample of 308 dated coins, a fig figure which in absolute terms is guaranteed to be incorrect, but equally any error should not affect the overall picture. Only one token is dated 1653, two for 1654, but 17% of the total comes from the next four years, taking us to 1659. Perhaps because of the restoration of Charles I at the end of May 1660, or the granting of the patent for the official farthings to Sir Thomas Armstrong, though not until December, there are only two official issues in, 16, uh, in 1662, one in 16, six, uh, 1660, one in 1661, and none in 1662. The situation is confused, however, if we look at Dublin slightly out of sequence. Obviously, the sample is smaller, 141 with over 56% undated. But the peaks and troughs are dramatic enough to overshadow any doubts about the sample size. 11% of the total are dated 1657, nearly 26% of the coins, coins with dates but only one issue dated 1658, and then no, again no dated issues until 1663. In other words, not really relating to uh, the restoration. No suppression, suppression proclamations survived before 1661. Could there be other causes for the tokens disappearing? Certainly Armstrong's coins made very little impact in Ireland and seem to have gone over, if at all, in very small quantities. I'm aware of no provenance example. With a distri discounted distribution system, as usual, officially guaranteed redemption, and a fan module similar to the penny tokens, perhaps we should look more deeply for the reasons that, for this than has hitherto been done. I have a strong suspicion that, once again, some blame can be put on the William Wood effect, even though Armstrong's payment of £16, 13 shillings and fourpence per year is perhaps an indication that expected profits were somewhere less than Wood's. The explanation may be simple as some, something as simple as reluctance of 
private token issuers to put dates on their coins for fear of prosecution, with no date it might be argued that an offending piece was old, in the same way as some of the less reputable early 18th, 17th century tokens backdated themselves. Given the proportion of undated pieces, this could have a very major impact. The effect is starting to wear off. Outside Dublin, we go from 0 in 1662 to 16, in other words, 5% in 1663, 15 in 1664, a dip in 1665 to 66, then another marked peak in 1667 to 71, which provides 33% of the total. The numbers plummet from 22 in 1671 to 8 in 1672. The same next year, 3 in 1674, none 1675, then fairly level amounts of production in 1677 to 79. It's worth noting, however, that the later coins are heavily concentrated in Munster, the province furthest away from Dublin. Whilst proclamations and other evidence for suppression is missing for the 1670s, and the patent for the regal halfpennies is dated May 1680, one, ca one month into the new year by the, by the contemporary calendar, it could be that the implementation or threat of it, of existing legislation, was sufficient to deter other dated issues. If one looks back at Dublin, however, a very different pattern emerges. Repeating the proviso that we are looking at dated pieces only, the clear peak is, is the just under 25% that appear in the 1654-57 period. 1657 produces the biggest number, number of any year, 18 or 12% of the total, followed by 1, then 0 in, until 1663, which is odd, to say the least. As well as legislation reasons, we should perhaps consider simple oversupply, especially within a limited geographic area, as, possible, as a possible control. At this point, it might be worth looking at what seems to me to be a clear comparator with the St. Patrick coins. The last dated Dublin issue is that put out by a butcher called Mick Wilson, MIC. First, one should caution against imposing a modern understanding of the term butcher, another a retailer who, se who sells meat. Just as it's unhelpful to regard William Wood as a hardware man, the existence of the silver 1730s threatens to token put out by Ben Do Bowen in Dublin should perhaps indicate that the term could span a wide range of wealth. The Hapney Mick Wilson token has an iconographically laden design, pairing the expected company arms with a vigorous represent representation of St George spearing the dragon, the patron saint of, of England destroying the spirit of evil and dissension. The scale of the issue, judging by the surviving numbers of what really is an insignificant little coin, may not have been that different to the St Patrick's period farthings and it's certainly much greater than the, than the halfpennies. This number is inflated by a large number of forgeries, the ma majority probably produced by Wilson himself, who could therefore avoid liability for payment and possibly for a lot of the genuine coins as well. A slightly unreliable source suggests that the city of Dublin lost little less than a thousand pounds thereby. That's an awful lot of halfpennies. Where the St. Patrick's comparison really kicks in is that both types of coins are found all over Ireland. Provenance finds of tokens are, have not been well recorded. Examples, however, tend to relate to the regions of issue as opposed to the immediate area site of the find spot. Odd examples from further and with only odd examples from further afield. Both the St. Patrick's and the Mick Wilson's circulated in the Isle of Man, where, instant, interestingly, the former Hapneys were regarded as pennies and the farthings as halfpennies. Their circulation in that of Mil Mick Wilson's is confirmed by provenance fines, but a tin riddled the Ireland Man Parliament, law of, of 24th of June 1679, enacts that no copper or brass money called butcher's halfpence, Patrick halfpence, or co and copper farthings, or any other of that nature shall pass in the island after first day of January next, or be, f or be paid or received by any manner of persons in exchange or payment after the said, said day upon the penalty of three pounds, blah, 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 blah. Provided this, this shall not be prejudicial or to hinder the passage of the king's far farthings and halfpence, sex for Seth fourth and authorised, or the brass money called John Murray's pence, da 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 da, yeah. 
to return to the official attempts to, provi to provide undoubtless profit from a copper coinage when can perhaps run together the presumed pattern halfpenny with the crown's CR cipher, referring perhaps to the Scottish designs iconographically, and the letter reproduced in Simon dated February 1674 to 75, indicating that the, at the proposed weights only minimal profit would be available to the undertakers of an unnamed coinage producing farthings and halfpennies. The size of the coins customarily designated halfpennies fits in not too badly with an over, slightly oversized farthing, which would explain the lack of profit. The final chapter of this story comes with the Dublin Corporation halfpenny dated 1679 with the legend, Long Live the King, and indeed the, the uh, overtly royalist sentiments on, on St. Patrick's coins are mirrored uh, on a surprising proportion of, of the other tokens, so perhaps it's unhelpful to regard it as a, as a diagnostic or, or decisive feature in their analysis. There may be a, be a slight parallel with the London plantation tokens, but you are much better able to judge that than me. The, um, the royalism seems to be the only overt political sentiment expressed by the legends and the tokens. This may perhaps be an indication that Car the Caroline loyalty of the St. Patrick's is not as significant as sometimes thought, and is reflective of a general cultural and political context rather than a specific. The granting of the patent for Hapenies to Sir Thomas Armstrong, son of the previous patentee, and Colonel Legg, who was also clearly very well connected, references both the 1660 grant and the remarks that allowance has not been received to issue the said farthing tokens as our royal coin amongst our subject of that kingdom. The quantity, of, the quantity was the amount that could be in, conveniently issued and they were to put, be put out at face value and redeemed at the same rate in silver, perhaps the first time this had been enacted for Ireland. These coins and their successors were clearly successful, to the extent that in, in 1729, Thomas Pryor was able to say that 20 years before, there was such an oversupply of halfpennies that they were being exported to the West Indies. Whether the St. Patrick's coins were driven out of circulation immediately in 16. 80 is still a moot point, and it will probably not be solved until archaeologists start providing dated horizons to numismatists rather than vice versa. Thank you. Right. The question is, is whether um, the dated tokens were, were backdated. Um, the general state of our knowledge is such that, that no, we don't. And what, what we'd have to do, and what somebody else hopefully will do, is work through the list of token issuers. There's um, you know, about 700 of them. And identify each one. Uh, and perhaps look for the dates in which they were operating in the, in the place of their issue. There also might be a chance by the, the, that the tokens stylistically and in terms of module are datable. So again, checking the uh, overt, overt stated date on a token with the, with the clear date of the module. And if we got two or three like that, that might be an indication of it. Um, if you could get away with issuing undated tokens, it would seem to indicate to me that there wasn't really a necessity to mess around with, with the dates, though it does remain a possibility. Sorry, you had another question. Yeah, yeah. secondly, uh, many of the other tokens in the period, do they have, do, do any of those other tokens have the same sort of overt stated date on them? Yeah. Um, the question is whether any of the other tokens have the same overtly Catholic icon iconography as the St. Patrick's. There, there is uh, a 17th century token with, uh, with the St. Patrick's design on it, which is issued by a man called Richard Greenwood in Dublin. I would deny uh, that the iconog iconography is overtly Catholic, um, that the established Church of Ireland, the Episcopalian Church, uh, was at this precise date was making efforts 
to take over St. Patrick as the national, national saint. Uh, and there wasn't a, a, a dichotomy between Catholicism and uh, uh, reverence for St. Patrick. Oh, lots of questions. Yes. Yeah. No, that that was that was in Carrick Fergus. My my syntax. Sorry, I didn't. Should repeat the the question. The the question was to uh, is whether the hoard of of Elizabethan copper was found in this country or in Ireland. Um, it was found in Carrick Fergus. The interesting thing about Carrick Fergus, which I didn't mention, is that the um, in the initial stages of, of the Elizabeth I, third coinage, uh, money had to be uh, changed at designated exchanges going in and out of Ireland. Uh, it was really a situation analogous to the former Eastern Europe where the coinage was, was internal and non-negotiable and illegal externally. Carrick Fergus was one of those exchanges, the only one in the north. Now, it, the, the exchanges other than from memory, Dublin and Cork, uh, only lasted for a year, and then it was it was centralised. Uh, the, the question is, is uh, basically to paraphrase, is why a Quaker um, will have taken um, coins with that particular iconography um, to the New World uh, and whether that is, was merely a, a, um, a sort of reflection of, of availability or, or, or disinterest. Um, I'm tempted to say I'm glad you asked me that. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> uh, to, to wriggle out, to give myself a little more time to think. Firstly, uh, the the Catholic Church was had no real, it had no power, no no real control in in, in Ireland at the time. Uh, both dissenters and Catholics were uh, disadvantaged in terms of of the, again, the established church. Yes, exactly, for, for Presbyterian. My, my, my family are Presbyterian, so I speak with some feeling about this. Um, my, my feeling is that perhaps um, there was, the, it, it's an indication that these coins were ceasing to be acceptable in Ireland, that they were discounted, um, that they would have, that, uh, that you wouldn't take a, take money, which wasn't going to be in itself negotiable um, in in the new world, unless you could buy it fairly cheaply. And I mean, I th and I mean, the immediate analogy which turned up at, at the COAG I would particularly like to have gone to is the one a few years ago, which looked at the at Hapneys of the faithful steward, where you know there's a ship wrecked on the new world, which is full of of, of um, forged Hapneys. From, from Ireland. So I I'm, would be hesitant to stretch that, that idea, but I think that it should at least push us slightly in that direction of thinking of them, that you know, these things were floating about and they'd really come to the, to the end of their, of their life, therefore you could buy them at you know, comparatively cheaply. And if he was aware that there's a shortage of coin in the new world, then he might have seen an opportunity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I mean the, the 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 communication system backwards and forwards was surprisingly good. Yeah. The 
the question is, is whether uh, the Maltravers or Rose Farthings have been found in Ireland. The Maltravers ovals uh, do, do, yeah, yeah, or the later ones, do turn up. Um, I have never come across a rose, and I would say that the rose farthings, because a lot of soil in Ireland is fairly acidic, and it sort of militates against the survival of, of base metal, uh, but I would say that the, the rose farthings are, are a much thicker module, therefore they would be more likely to survive. They turn up everywhere in England, you know, are, are very, very common finds. So if they were circulating, I would have expected to find them. Again, one of the things which I didn't share with you in the talk to, to keep things fairly simple is that um, Scottish turners turn up uh, at least in the north of Ireland in some quantities. Uh, I know of at least two hordes of them and multiple uh, single finds. Uh, both the smaller uh, thin Charles I ones uh, and uh, the earlier James I and the early part of J Charles I reign, the thicker ones which circulated along with French double tournois. And some of the 17th century tokens are struck uh, on top of the French double tournois. Now, the complication there is that uh, 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 a, a um, S Scottish shilling was worth a twelfth of, a, of a, an English one. So I'll let you work out what Topham Scots works out in Ireland where the shilling Eng where the Irish shilling was worth ninepence but so um, th there were large Scottish armies in Ireland until 1649 so it may be that that coinage came over with them as well as there being that very close connection with the north I'm not aware of them being found in the south of Ireland but it's an indication of again of base metal coinage circulating Oh, right, sorry. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the Richmond's and Lennox farthings, I have come across no fines. So. Yeah. Yeah, not, not many people have. Um, pr prior wrote the seminal and um, most uh, lucid book on uh, money um, in Ireland in, in the first half of the, of the 18th century. Um, it has been, as far as I know, totally ignored by scholars. Um, Simon plagiarised it heavily. The table of circulating uh, foreign coin in Ireland is lifted verbatim from prior. Um, and uh, Pryor is a very interesting person because, again, he was a linen draper. He was one of the founders of the Royal Dublin Society. He is most famous currently for having written uh, a book, A List of Absentees, which is one of the, the standard texts of nationalism from the 18th century through to the end of the 19th century about the economic effect of, of rents being um, exported to, to England uh, by absentee landlords. Uh, he was writing as part of this controversy about the imbalance between gold and, uh, gold and silver, um, which is something I could bore you all at for some hours, but I won't. <laughs> The, the question is whether Mark Newby used, if I, I'm hearing you right, uh, the St. Patrick's when he, when he was in, in Ireland. Um, given the ubiquity of fines, I would say that's almost inevitable, um, that, the, that they are, along with the Mick Wilsons, the one issue which uh, seems to have spread wi widely geographically. And as I say, that my, one of the problems is that, that uh, one can only rely on one's own knowledge of fines, that, that they really haven't been, uh, single fines of copper have not been recorded except in the single find index in the Ulster Museum. 
uh, which I was in charge of, the National Museum in Dublin doesn't record such things. Um, and the, the record doesn't go back uh, beyond the 1950s. So. The question is, is that most of the 17th century tokens were clearly manufactured in Ireland, so, or in England rather. Some of them were um, manufactured in, in Ireland, and the later one, particularly the later ones, and whether the capacity existed within, Ar within Ireland to produce something as, as large and complex as St. Patrick's coinage. Um, there, b b the locally manufactured tokens are worthy of analysis and I know in in the north there I can see commonality in technique between some of this very small number of locally man manufactured issues I, I'm not altogether sure whether they're the la universally the la later ones or not my feeling again is is obviously um, Armstrong uh, and Leg, uh, when they set up their, their mint, had to have a, a coining press of some sophistication. And that, that and in fact, that, that tradition of coining and this, uh, possibly the same equipment it ha continues right through until the production of the brass money in, the, in 1689, which in turn was, was, a, was an extremely large and, and sophisticated coinage. <laughs> I would not like to, to hazard a guess as to whether the, that the manufacturing capacity existed. It would, if there was manufacturing capacity, it must have been something quite substantive. Even if the, if the dyes are made elsewhere, um, the, you know, striking coins the size of the halfpennies um, will re have required a large press um, a lot of sophistication in terms of, of flan production, etc. Um, it possibly would have been worth somebody setting up that sort of facility, but I think it is, it's much more likely that it, that it would have been uh, somewhere else, you know, that, that it makes much more sense for it to be, to be located uh, elsewhere. The Mick Wilsons are, well, that, the, the question is whether the Mick Wilsons were made in Ireland. The genuine, quote, Mick Wilsons look like uh, an English produced token. The forged Mick Wilsons are crude, and, and I've, I have a vague notion, and I'm relying on my notoriously unreliable memory, that why they discovered Mick Wilson was forging his own tokens was that they found a coining press in the back of his shop. Um, but I'd need to confirm that. <laughs> Yes, the, the, the question is, is, the two, is about the two Armstrong issues. Armstrong issues, yes. Thomas, Sir Thomas Armstrong Sr. Uh, got a patient, patent to reduce uh, farthings, um, which were the size of, of basically of the, of the penny tokens. The, Sir Thomas Armstrong Jr., in partnership with a, with a man called Colonel Legg, who, who pops up all the time in, in economic uh, activity, uh, got the patent to produce hatenies. And I think, my, I think I've more than overrun my time. Thank you, Robert, for a wonderful elucidation of the setting of 17th century Irish tokens. Our next speaker, um, really for most of us, requires no introduction, Philip Mossman, 
uh, is a very distinguished colonial numismatist, author of Money of the American Colonies and Confederation, which has become the standard reference in our field. Uh, he was just yesterday evening the recipient of the 2005 uh, Archer Huntington Award from the American Numismatic Society. Dr. Mossman's um, distinguished career in medicine probably prepares him to analyze slight differences in all sorts of things. So uh, he's going to be delivering a talk on the denominations of the St. Patrick's coinage. We'd like to welcome him here this morning. I beg your pardon? Uh, you may leave off your coat, of course, but it's not. It's, Yes, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll have a little hiatus here. Uh, but the, we've got Well, yeah. 